And welcome to Philosophy Roulette 49, time appropriate greetings wherever you may be. We, this is New York, it's a end of a cool day and uh, my dad has a sense of humor because he got this beer. <sighs> Thanks dad, get me my beer. Um, yeah, so we're looking at some, we just did a philosophy paper from Mind early in the day, let's see. Can the mind wander intentionally? Mind and light hold. I just did mind, mind and light. Modern theology. I am no no theology with nanoethics. Maybe that's like really really small ethics. Maybe that's like good. Maybe they'll have like really small. Let's see. Uh, modern theology. These are like tons of reviews, responses, reviews, response. I don't know, like, uh, I feel like I'd, I'd be dipping my uh, toe into something I'd really not prepared to talk about. Like, Nulla Proportio and Concordatia, Catholic Political Theology and the Mystery of Consensus. Well, hey, if it's here and it, it says it's uh, only 13 pages, let's see, this one's only like 6 pages. Oh. I mean, if they're available, I don't know. Let's see. Nope. No. Okay, so now, what about nanoethics? Let's take a look. Hmm. Does seem to have a lot of short papers. So maybe it is like a short paper. Oh, that would be so much fun. Another short paper. Uh, you know, I'm a little, uh, it says nanotechnology. So is it just me or is it? Do they have like really small font and it's like a uh, medical journal where everything's like teeny and it need that's why it's so few page count. Well, let's try something. Let's see. Uh, moral fictional discourse on assisted reproduction. Let's see. Oh, please be available. Woo! Oh, HTML. Is it open access? Hmm. Let's see if there's a uh, PDF and see what I can do. Okay, nine pages. All right, that's why. Yeah, it's a uh, nine pages, but like teeny font, and it's double uh, two per page. Let's see if I want to bother with this. Hmm. Yeah. You know, let's give it a shot. Cool. Okay, let's uh, update the old. All right, so if you come by live, you can uh, type uh, exclamation point paper in the uh, chat and you'll get yourself a uh, link right to here. And let's get this. Oh boy, look at that. Uh, all right, so. Mm, am I gonna be able to get anything else? No, I'm not gonna get all this. Okay, at least get the title in. Okay. <coughs> so, here we go. Special section. This special section explores perspectives on new reproductive technologies and genome editing from different fields in both academic disciplines such as bioethics and fictional narrations such as literature and film. There is a great anticipation for these new technologies, but also great concern. It is not always easy to determine what an appropriate reaction to these technologies consists of, but because in both professional and popular discourses, moral arguments are often intertwined with narratives of hype and hope or utopian and dystopian scenarios. The aim of our special issue is to, oh, is this the uh, introduction? Oh, this is an introduction. All right, we're not doing that then. That's too bad. Like that looked a lot of fun, but I don't want to just like have uh, blurbs on uh, all the other papers. <coughs> Shucks. Okay, let's go see if uh, the next one is there. Okay, engineering life. Try that one. Uh, it's like. A... Mm. 
engineering life. Okay. Yeah, this must be open access. Everything open, at least. Let's see. Okay, this is like super short. All right. And actually, let's assume it's like six pages, not three. So it's not it's terribly short. But cool. Okay. Cool. Okay, so now here we really go, as opposed to before. Editorial. Um, all right. As long as, as long term. Oh no! Is this? I'm not having any luck here. This is an editorial talking about the issue itself. Serves me not for reading abstracts. Dag nabbit. All right. Let's try the next one down. Come on, baby. This is why it's roulette. We don't know what we're gonna get here. Ugh. Yeah, and these are, and now this one of course is not available. Next one down, let's try that. I mean, this sounds like so much fun, like cloning technologies in young adult fiction. Buzz to brush critical marks and turn life an applicable. Alright, so maybe that one's there because of the uh, download count. Let's see if this one's here. Nope. Thank you, Mr. Steisinger. Ugh. Okay, so, okay. That's the title at least. We got all of it. Um. Let's see how the roulette goes then. Come on, baby. Twenty-six pages. This is what I get for being uh, optimistic. I'm not doing that then. Oh, look at that. The one that I yeah. All right. <sighs> try, try again. Nope. I'm getting frustrated with the journal. Come on, journal. Review of content. Okay, so let's see. See, it got 16 downloads. That usually, in, when everything else has one, nope, still not here. Maybe the authors are just popular. All right, that's it. Sorry, nanoethics. You were kind of cool, but like, didn't work out. What love is not? Lessons from Martin Luther King Jr. That'd be cool. Come on, modern theology. Ah. Okay. This looks like things I'm not going to be able to pronounce, but I will sacrifice that just to have something to read at this point. All right, let's double check the page count this time. 19. It is double spaced, but oh, come on. Yeah, it's, this is the limit of. I don't want to do something that long because I, I, if I'm reading for like two hours, it's no fun. I have to pick some one of one of these. Oh, also David Newhouser. Interesting. Five to twelve. Let's see. One to eleven. I can handle that. Okay. So here we go. We're doing David Neuheiser, ACU, Why the World Needs Negative Political Theology. Sounds cool. Let's go for it.
Mm-hmm. Okay. So, why the world needs negative pe- political theology by David Neuheiser. Some theorists argue that religion relates to politi- politics in one of two ways. Either it asserts its authority over the public sphere or it withdraws from the world in preference for spiritual concerns. Okay. In response to this special... Oh, no. Special issues officers and expanded... It- Alright, I'm through with this. I'm through with this. I'm sorry. We're going back to analysis. And, uh... I apologize. This is... Alright. Analysis or thought. Analysis or thought. Now, uh, analysis. Just don't have to scroll as much. Hmm... Come on. Arrgh. I'm gonna have to go to like the hub of science and just start doing things uh, inappropriate and just getting these. Mathem- I skipped that one in between because I did that one already. Recent works on pain. Come on, peoples. Mm. Thank you, Fabrice Correa, Sven Rosenkrantz. Thank you. All right, and uh, <sighs> okay, seven times a charm, you know. Sometimes you get lucky, and other times you do not. So we're gonna find out. You know, I actually had a different thought. I was there is a uh, blog I follow. Uh, philosophy blog and they had just posted that uh, there was an open access uh, edition of a journal and I was like you know what I could just do this short article from that open access edition but that's silly why would I go pick something ahead of time should have done first instinct is usually right on this stuff yeah 13 minutes dead come on so-called A theory of time is often pre- presented as a package including both realism about tense, that is, the view that the contrast between what was, what is, and what will be the case is real, and not merely an outward projection of the way reality is represented in thought, about, and realism about temporal passage, that is, the view that the passage of time is a real phenomenon, is the same sense of real. Okay, so... Tense, the, what was, all right, so we got all of, all right, this is the A theory of time, past, present, and future, and it's all real, and so is the passage of time is real, so. The question of whether these views can be held without the other has hardly ever been addressed in the literature. There is a straightforward and we think compelling argument to the effect that realism about temporal passage entails realism about tense. To say that time passes is to say that what is the case is not always the same, and therefore the passage of time cannot be a real phenomenon unless the distinction between what was, is, and will be the case is also real. What we want to discuss here is the converse claim that realism about tense entails realism about temporal passage. Okay. The combination of realism about tense and anti-realism about temporal passage may look unmotivated. Some may even argue that it lacks motivation because the only serious motivation for being a realist about tense in the first place is the desire to secure realism about temporal passage. However, our question is not whether this combination of views is motivated, but whether it is consistent. This consistency question would still remain interesting even if it had already been established that tense realism come anti-realism about passage lacks motivation. Why? Why would it be interesting then if it can't work? Okay. For whether a view is motivated is highly a highly contextual matter. 
If a view presently lacks motivation, it may well be motivated later. Uh, yeah, sure, everything comes around with philosophy. Yet if the view is shown to be inconsistent, then no motivation for it will be dialectically effective. Let me introduce you to some inconsistent, uh, some people who have inconsistent theories. That would be lots of people, and there's even people who are proud to be inconsistent. So, not even sure that this is gonna hold up over time either. It seems to us that most philosophers working on the metaphysics of time do believe that the combination of realism about tense and anti-realism about temporal passage is consistent. Two philosophers have recently voiced this belief. Thus, Kit Fine, arguing against what he calls standard realism, says that even if presentness is allowed to shed its light upon the world, there's nothing in the standard realist metaphysics to prevent that light being frozen on a particular moment in, of time. And Ross Cameron, in the course of explaining why he decided to use the label A theory for the combination of realism about tense and realism about temporal passage, argues as follows. Here is a view. The stock, the, excuse me, the stuck spotlight theory. All time, past, present, and future are real, and there is an objectively privileged time, and it is always November 30th, 1982. That is a coherent view, for all I know. It is even metaphysically possible. Like, so... Oh, I was old. I was alive. I'm old. Our main aim is to argue that there is a large class of tense realists to be spec specified in due course and the entailed realism about temporal passage. Cool. Okay. I'm, I'm doing that paper tomorrow morning. I'm not going to pick a paper. I'm just going to pick that one that I know exists so I don't get stuck like today. But not that I'm, I'm unhappy about this paper, it's just I did not want to have to like go through four papers first. Let us first focus on the spotlight theory, which we take to combine the view that Timothy Williamson calls permanentism, that is, the view that always everything always exists, in the sense of is identical to something, with the view that there is a metaphysically robust property of presentness for times. The moving spotlight theory is usually characterized as the spotlight theory plus further claim that this robust property of presentness attaches to different times as times go by. We want to argue that this addition is unnecessary, that is, the spotlight theory already precludes that the property of presentness it postulates is frozen on a particular time. Importantly for our argument, we distinguish between the spotlight theory's notion of being a present time in the robust sense and another thin notion of being present of being a present time, which should be acceptable to all parties of the standard debate about temporal ontology, realist and anti-realist about tense alike. The, this latter notion can be captured by the predicate is denoted by now, where now is the familiar indexical. To avoid ambiguities, we shall use the uppercase letters for expressions that signify that the spotlight theory's robust notion of presentness is present capital, presentness, etc. The small caps. and. The lowercase is a present time for being synonymous with is denoted by now. Okay, so we've got the theoretical entities are these cap words and the sort of the what we talk about in the uh, object language is lowercase. Okay. Crucially, is denoted by now, lowercase, should not be confused with is now. The two predicates are coextensive, that, that is, they follow the, the following sentence is true. For all times t, t is denoted by now if and only if t is now. Yet they are not interchangeable in all tense logical contexts. Indeed, the following sense is false. 24 hours ago, for all times t, t is denoted by now if and only if t is now. For suppose 2 is uttered at time u, since now is understood as the familiar indexical, the utterance of u of 2 is true simplicator and if and only if the following sense Type is true at u. 24 hours ago, for all times t is denoted by now, if and only if t is u. And we, assuming that 3 is true at u, so will then be 24 hours u is denoted by now. But 4 is not true at u, since the time v that is 24 hours before u now denoted v rather than u. This, last, this very last claim is a consequence of a general principle that we take to be a conceptual truth. Always for all times t at t, t is denoted by now. Okay. The previous argument shows that replacing is denoted by now and five is and by is now yields a falsehood. Okay, so yeah, is now being denoted by it when it said matters because you're this is a you're slipping in a mention in some sense by this denotation, and so the mention can change when because that is also sort of an indexical. 
um, to when it was mentioned. And so you're switching times, I guess, at some point. You're doing a second um, switch. Now, if you say it when you're saying is now and denoted by now, it's self-referential to the same now. But if you, again, if like they did here, they switched out when the denotation was made, then you've got a second indexical and that is going to change the noun. One will then be now soon. That's what's gonna happen. The spotlight theorist notion of being present at a time and the neutral notion of being present at a time just introduced are distinct. As we have emphasized, the neutral notion should be acceptable to all parties while the, the notion of being present capitals time is not. Yet the two notions are connected via the following bridge principle. Six, for all times t, t is present in the formal sense if and only if, no, only if, t is present only if t is a present time. Six must be recognized as true for all those who countenance the notion of being present capitals, in particular those who, like the spotlight theories, take this notion to be exemplified. With these preliminary considerations in place, we proceed to argue that assuming the spotlight theory, the present, cannot be frozen on a particular time. We start by establishing that assuming permanentism, the present lowercase, cannot be frozen on a particular time. Suppose for reductio that the present is frozen on some time, say t. This means that t is, always was, and always will be a present time. Clearly, sometimes there is a dis time distinct from t. Given permanentism, this implies that there is, some, say, some time u, such that t sometimes t is not u. So it's a broken clock, but it's not the time that the broken clock is right. Given that every time is a present time at itself, and that what is true at some time is sometimes true, we can infer that sometimes u is a present time. Since by hypo hypothesis t is always a present time, we can infer that sometimes both t and u are present time. Broken clock is right sometimes. Since there can never be distinct present times, we can infer that sometimes t equals u. Yes, the broken clock is right sometimes. Since times that are sometimes identical are always identical, we can infer that always t equals u. And hence, it is not the case that sometimes t equals u. Contradiction. Okay. Given this result, the argument for the claim that the present cannot be frozen is straightforward. Given six and, fa and fairly weak principles of quantified tense logic, if there is a time that is always present, there is a time that is always present. We have just established that no time is always present. Therefore, we can conclude that no time is always present in the formal sense of always being present. Okay. So, we, it's a little bit funny because the... the, <coughs> the I believe what they're saying here, but like defining present is always true whenever you are at some present time. You've got like two senses of the word and then you're trying to uh, make it, since all times are present and all things are identical with themselves and what, that are sometimes identical with themselves, then being called present is, um, it's like being called true. Like when you say like, I'm not true, then it's like the truth maker. It doesn't quite make sense why you're calling something present this particular you, uh, the present time, or this particular T. So there's something uh, interesting going on with self-reference there, but it's more complex than I can think of right now. But it's like the truth teller, not the liar paradox, but like the truth teller paradox. But that's kind of interesting. Okay, our argument involves statements that mix tense logic, logical operators, and quantifiers. Putting aside special cases, reasoning with such statements is not tri trivial. Let's formalize our argument before we can we comment on its soundness. The argument can be regimented in a first order tense logical language with identity. So let us use so uh, <laughs> that's not a so that's a s phi for it is sometimes the case that phi that is it is sometimes it is sometimes was or sometimes will be the case that phi and a phi for it is always the case that phi uh, that is it is always always was always will be and always always was, is, and will be the case at phi. So the S is sort of the existential, and the uh, A is the uh, universal, and then we've got the at symbol, at u phi is, it, 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 is, it, it is the case at time u that phi. The regimented argument involves the following seven subst substantial principles whose quantifiers are understood to be restricted to times. Okay, so we've got at some time, some, Okay, for some time that exists, <laughs> there exists some time, if, if some, at some point in time, 
there exists some T phi, then there exists some T that sometimes phi. All right, you guys can, I'm not gonna read through the, uh, man, I was kind of hope with, I'd get away with not having to read formal stuff, but y'all have to have to read this if you are interested. All right, so skipping ahead, you can, there are seven of them, B, F, and P, one through six. So I may have to refer back to them. Beyond these principles, the argument only involves the tense logical principle, min, uh, always phi, oh, if always phi, then sometimes psi, then sometimes phi and psi. Okay, so if it's always the case that phi, and it happens to be sometimes psi, then there is some time where it's both psi and phi. Okay, and the background logic for the truth functional connectives and the quantifiers can be taken to boil down to the classical propositional calculus plus the following standard quantificational axioms and rules, and they're just uh, mod doing the backwards E is not for all, not. And then what do we got here? We got distribution of time over uh, implication. Um, you've got, in, uh, you got universal in, uh, introduction of a time. So for some phi, for any t phi, with a, assuming there's a free a, t, a time free in phi, and you can um, so if phi that, and you can always just throw a time thingy in front of a phi. Okay. We call this background logic the propositional quantificational or PQ basis. Okay, so it's it's a pretty it seems like a pretty standard sort of stuff about what they were saying. Um, yeah, okay. For the, the regimented argument runs as follows, where line one contains a hypothesis made for the reductio and line eight contains and the absurd conclusion. The conclusion is indeed inconsistent given the PQ basis and the column on the right indicates what is used apart from PQ basis to derive line two through eight. Okay, so this basically is the formal run-through of the argument I spelled out earlier where they got the contradiction saying the present time is not the present time. So there is some, and that's the uh, line 8 here, is there is a TU such that T equals U and T does not equal U. And so there, there is a present time that is not the present time. Okay. <coughs> we assess the argument by running through the various items it invokes. The PQ base is safe. Importantly, the quantificational postulates listed above are extremely weak. They are indeed too weak to fully characterize the universal quantifier, since at least a principle of universal instantiation or existential generalization should be added to the list. Yeah, up here when I was saying that you could add sort of uh, the universal, you can't really, uh, they didn't give an instantiator though. So it didn't go the other way. You could uh, generalize but not instantiate. Um, and should be added to list, be it unrestricted in the class of quantification, they are restricted as in free logic. This weakness is an asset. Yeah, because if you don't have that, you're gonna save yourself a lot of complexity. Min is a valid in minimal tense logic. We take minimal tense logic as a whole, and min in particular to be unproblematic. The BF, the Barkin formula, that's what the BF was. I wasn't paying too much attention. Oh, yeah, because they're treating um, the sometimes operator kind of like a modal so it's a bargain for both quantifier restricted to times is controversial yeah that's not so uh obvious some presentists reject it they hold that in the past there was a time at which dinosaurs existed but deny that there presently is a time such that dinosaurs exist at that time because they hold that there is exactly one time t and that is not the case that sometimes dinosaurs exist at t however bf it's compulsory for permanent permanentists, yes. For suppose that sometimes there is a time t that meets condition phi, then by permanentism, sometimes there is a t that meets condition phi, and which always exists and hence exists now. Permanentism basically has a fixed universe. So it's around somewhere in the universe. But then obviously, since being a time is not a property, they can only be had temporarily. There now is a time t that sometimes meets condition phi. We believe with orthodoxy that numerical identity and distinctness are permanent, and hence both P5 and P6 hold. We might even take P5 and P6 to be logical truths, given they follow from minimal tense logic, quantificational postulates of the PQ basis, and the usual axioms for identity. There are controversies about whether numerical identity and distinctness are permanent, but these controversies, controversy, 
controversies typically concern so-called material objects. Since P5 and P6 in the quantification in the quantifier uh, since in P5 and 6 the quantifiers are restricted to times, we take these controversies to be irrelevant in the present context. Um, let's double check what P5 and P6 are. Uh, okay. Basically, it says for any time, it's if it's identical. If it if there is some time, then that time is there are for any two times. If there's some time that they're equal, then they are then those times are equal uh, universally. Um. And conversely, if there if there's no time that they are sometimes equal, then they are never equal for any two times. Um. I'm not sure about that. You might, uh, I, I mean, perhaps I'm referring back to the HUD Hudson piece. Um, HUD Hudson had a nice multi historical uh, piece on multi histories. And so perhaps um, HUD Hudson would deny P5 or P6. But, um, because, but in there, there, there are ways to have multiple time uh, lineages. And so, Maybe depending on how you slice this up, but given the orthodoxy that they are referring to here Yes, I think most people assume that if a time is identical to itself, then it stays I that time is always identical to itself Okay, p1 is not a logical truth yet. It is metaphysical substance is yet. It's metaphysical substance is very thin p1 does not say that given any time There is at least a distinct time this last claim is accepted by many tense realists, but not all some presentists believe that there is exactly one time. P1 makes the weaker presentistical, presentistically acceptable claim that given any time, there sometimes is at least a distinct time. This we take to be uncontroversial. Hmm, is it? All right, so there is time for any time. There is some time when it's not another time. Um, uh, I guess, yeah, so there sometimes is at least a distinct time, so that means there is some other time, at least sometimes. Alright, um, I have to grant that. P2 is a direct consequence of 5 above, we take to conceptual truth, um, recall that we understand is a present time is denoted by now so right, i'll take their word on that one we also take the remaining principles p3 and p4 to have that says p3 is a schema that states that what is true at sometimes is sometimes true after this being denied i could probably find someone that denies it p4 immediately follows from the observation that now never refers to do two distinct instances of in instincts of instance of time all right this concludes our argument for the claim that on the spotlight theory the present cannot be frozen on a particular time um, I don't particularly like the phrasing of this conclusion. Um, I might just say it's not coherent to say it's frozen on a particular time, um, or consistent. Uh, it, well, yeah, okay. Because again, uh, there are inconsistent theories and maybe presently just one of those inconsistent things. We'll see. Okay, a permanentism independent version of the argument. The assumption of permanent uh, permanentism in the pre previous argument was crucial, but as we show now, there is a very similar argument that does not involve this assumption. The argument, like the previous one, divides into two parts. It is first argued that the present cannot be frozen, and then, as before, from this conclusion and bridge principle six, it is inferred that the present cannot be frozen either. Um, that would be present capitals. Here's the first part. Suppose for reductio that the present is frozen on some time, say t. This means that it always t is a present time. Clearly, sometimes there is some there is a time u such that t is not u. Given that always every time is a present time at itself, and that always what is true at some time is sometimes true, we can infer that sometimes there is a time u such that both t does not equal u and sometimes u is a present time. Since by hypothesis t is always a present time, it is always pre it is always, always a present time, and we can therefore infer that sometimes there is a u such that both t is not equal to u and sometimes both t and u are present times. Since there can never be di distinct present times, we can infer that sometimes there is a u such that both t is not equal to u and sometimes t equals u. 
given that being sometimes identical entails being identical, we can infer that sometimes there is a time you suck to have both t is not equal to you and t equals you, yet this cannot be the case. The most immediate difference between this argument and the previous one is that BF is not used to move from sometimes there is U such that T is not equal to U to there is sometimes U such that T is not equal to U. Sometimes to there is. That's um, looks like the big switch here. Which, as it were, makes the subsequent reasoning occur within the scope of the operator sometimes. Okay. We can devise a regimented version of the argument which involves only P, Q, Min, and the tense principle okay so they're doing uh for any time phi then it will always phi any time always phi then always always phi so anytime anytime phi anytime phi then it's any time that anytime anytime phi. okay well don't know how to say that properly but we've got um then a set of alternate principles or presuppositions that are starred um, that work, I guess, with this um, theory. Note that each result from the corresponding non-starred principle by prefixing the quanter for all u with a. Okay, so, oh wait, wait, this is not a uh, always always principle? Let's see. Okay. What's the A then? I'm, I'm losing what the A is. The tenth logic principle AA. For any A implies any any A. Uh, I'm not sure. I should probably, uh, maybe it's a standard thing. But I, I didn't quite understand what the A is doing. Okay, so maybe they're gonna spell it out. All right, so they run through their argument again and they get their contradiction again. Okay, but they didn't use the Barkin formula to do it. <coughs> Note that the conclusion in line 9 is inconsistent given PQ basis plus the rule of inference um, phi, and then you can throw not, sometimes not, phi. Uh, the, yeah, the A is the uh, always. Not for any, it's the always. That's right, so it's always, always. Okay. We've already argued in favor of the PQ theory, sis. Min. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I forgot what was going on. Drink more beer. Okay, so they did the argument. The rule of inference just alluded to is, is a validity, validity preserving rule of minimal tense logic, and as we already stressed, we take this logic to be unproblematic. The only substantial extra element is the new argument AA. And the, usually, and the usual Kripke style model for tense logic AA is valid on temporal structure if and only if the relation of temporal accessibility, x is, at, is access to y if and only if on df, x equals y or x is before y and or y is before x is transitive, yep. Given this condition fails, if for instance the temporal structure is forward branching, given that forward branching is taken very seriously in certain philosophical debates, cannot simply ignore it. Even if AA is rejected, the proposed argument can still be recycled into an argument for the negation of line 5, namely for the claim that no one that no time is always, always a present time. This, we take it, is good enough. For what sense would it make to hold that sometimes is that sometime is always, but not always, always a present time? Even if we do agree that there is no logically valid transition from T is always a present time to T is always, always a present time, we fail to see how one could reasonably accept the former but not the latter. Well, as I said earlier, HUD Hudson seems to have two time senses, and so if you do that, maybe you have two senses of always then. Um, yeah, but I mean, that was also a branching time structure. So, that, uh... I'll have to take the word for it. I'm not fast enough to think through the logic and read the paper at the same time. But, not that I could do it anyway, but whatever. Maybe one day. All right, so let's take the word for it. Um, this sort of uh, AA, like, uh, introspection, <laughs> temporal intros introspection principle will have to be accepted. Um, and uh, let's move on. Okay. Well, again, getting to the end, actually. So far, we have argued that the presentness could be frozen on a particular moment of time, cannot be endorsed by a tense realist, irrespective of whether she is a permanentist or not. 
Obviously, there is a gap between this conclusion and the claim that no tense realist can endorse the view that time could fail or to really pass, since not all versions of tense realism need to allow for characterization of temporal passage in terms of a metaphysically robust notion of presentness. For instance, a tense realist impressed by Williamson's rejection of such a notion would reject such a characterization. However, the previous argument can be modified to reach a much broader class of tense realism. The only principle involving the concept of presentness capital that was used in the arguments for real passage are, for all times t always, t is present capital, if and only if t is a present time. And if, and a principle giving sufficient condition for real passage, namely, passage, uh, there is there really is temporal passage if some time is present, capital sense, and is not the case that sometimes is always present. Okay, that's passage. As a consequence, if we are the right, if we are right that the present lowercase cannot possibly be frozen on a particular moment of time, then any theory which countenances principles that revolt from six and pass by replacing is present capital sense by another predicate will be committed to the reality of temporal passage. Now we submit many versions of tense realism do, or at least should, countenance such principles. Thus, repla rep thus replacing is present in both six and passage by the tense predicate exists yields principles that are compulsory for some versions of presentism. The same holds of the predicate is the last time, and all versions of the growing block theory are faithful to C. Oh, to C D Broad's original view. <laughs> uh, these suggestions require specific temporal ontologies, but other suggestions do not consider the concrete non concrete distinction that Linsky and Zalta and Williamson invoke in the context of modal metaphysics to replace the distinction between what is actual, understood in a metaphysically robust sense, and what is not. Williamson uses this distinction in the context of temporal metaphysics to replace the distinction between what is present capital and what is not. On that account, replacing is present capital in six and passage by is concrete yields highly plausible principles. Another example is the predicate is accurate, induced by Doran Goodman, forthcoming, which applies to a time t if and only if all the all and only the true propositions are true at t. So is accurate, is only is accurate to a time t. Okay. Replacement by this predicate yields highly plausible principles, given the natural assumption that there is no distinct time at which the very same propositions are true. This example of particular import is of particular importance because the accuracy can be defined using fairly neutral con conceptual resources, namely quantification into, sent into sentential position, the at t operator, a predicate for times and the material biconditional. The previous considerations show that many versions of tense realism are committed to realism about temporal passage, although we still have not reached the conclusion that no tense realist can be an anti-realist about temporal passage, what has been shown is already significant given the range of views covered by our argument. As conclusion, however, we submit that all sensible versions of tense realism entail realism about temporal passage. The claim follows from the claim that the present lowercase cannot be frozen on a particular time, which we have defended at length above, and further claim that all sensible versions of tense realism must account as a notion that is connected to the concept of being present time and the concept of temporal passage, in the way that six and passage say that presentness, capitalist, is connected to them. The last claim we find overwhelmingly plausible. Okay, this was nice. Um, again, at the beginning they said that like they don't actually argue for what like the strong claim, they just argue that a sensible sort of view that um, you have to have that given their setup you have to sort of realize that their conclusion that the opposite conclusion like uh, denying what they're saying is gonna be bad um, okay so tense realism entail realism about temporal passage and that all sensible versions um, I'm sure there's some less sensible versions of things which can be done um, like inconsistent times and whatnot, which I would assume is in the less sensible uh, class of things and not very plausible according to them, but yeah, it's reasonable. Um, they set this up uh, sort of nicely with the logic actually. This was, I thought, kind of well done. The 
is it just basically generating a self-referential uh, paradox or contradiction based off of this time is present. And so then if you, then as time moves, that time is not present. So if you somehow fix the uh, capital thing, like is true, you get yourself a uh, liar style or semantic style or tent style paradox. Um, so that's nice. Uh, nice paper. Um, and if you're interested in time, that's kind of a cute result. Not cute, but a nice cut and dry result um, that they uh, put forth. Okay, thanks for listening. I uh, hope everyone stays safe and uh, happy and healthy. I'll be back tomorrow, probably, for another paper. Probably the one I'll do that sometime tomorrow, maybe, maybe not tomorrow morning. But uh, if you have any suggestions what I should read, let me know, and uh, have a good day.